very good morning, and thank you very much for coming again for, uh, for this lecture. And today we are going to talk about uh, market and marketing. And um, the outline of the lecture would be what is marketing, how to select ideas for projects and products and services to suit the market, what is a life cycle of a product or a service, and then I'll talk about something we call Crossing the Chasm. This is actually a title of a book, and I'm going to speak uh, a bit more about that. And um, I'll talk about market evolution, entry to market, marketing, novel products and services, products that are very, very new, and uh, what is disruptive innovation in, in the context of marketing, and um, how do we market commoditized uh, products and services, and eventually we'll talk about marketing in a mature market. So this would be the things that we are talking about. But before we start, let me ask you a question, and I would like you to please uh, uh, give us answers, and the mics will be passed around. What is marketing for you? So you just raise your hand, wait for the mic to come to you if you would like to answer. What is marketing? Yes, please. So speak into the mic, please. Yeah. I say successfully selling the product to the customers. So marketing is selling a product to, to the, the customer. OK, so marketing is selling. Yes, what else? Uh, I said the knife. Yeah. Um, creating awareness towards, uh, I mean, uh, for the people to know about the product and uh, making them aware about what you want to sell. Right. So making, creating awareness. of products and services. Yes, knife? He, he said the same thing. Exactly the, yeah, same thing. exactly the same thing. Right. OK, so creating awareness, making people know about your product or services. Any other idea? Yeah, please. Um, means of communicating to the, pro, uh, to the customer. So, so communicating to the customer. What else? Anyone would like to say anything else? Yes, please. OK. I would say this is about profit. Profit. Yeah. So marketing is creating a profit. So if you market and you don't create a profit, then the mic will come to you. Marketing is it's a, a department. It's a department in, one or in the organization to, marketing is to a, do all those things. Marketing is a department. Great. Anyone else want to say something? Yeah. The winners of the business plan competition? Um, for me, marketing is about convincing the users to purchase uh, your product or even to accept your product in general. It's not right. really necessary have to make a profit, but rather than um, people accepting your item in the market. I mean, right, so market is about acceptance. Marketing is about acceptance of the service, the value proposition you are proposing. Yes, Mike? Uh, I think it's about conveying the value of your product or service to the customer. Right, it's about conveying a value proposition or a value in general, a value proposition. Great. Anyone wants to say anything else? OK, great. This is, this is, this is good. Actually, none, none of this is not true. Marketing is a department. Marketing uh, maybe is done with the intention of the profit, of, of creating profit, communicating, conveying. But let me just try to think with you. This seems 
to imply that there is a department within an organization that, that is entrusted with creating a product or a service, developing a product or a service. And there is another department with the function of selling, conveying, convincing, uh, communicating, uh, achieving the acceptance of that product that has been developed in a different setup to the market. Are we, are we on the same page? Is this what? And, and this could be true and still true to, to many organizations. So that you have a technical department that will make maybe a computer, uh, um, a phone, or any product, or a service. Then it's developed, it's almost complete. You'll give it to another department. And that department, what would they normally do to convey the message, to communicate to the customer? The marketing department, what, would, what, is, what are their tools to achieve these objectives? Yeah, I said, I think, wants to answer. Yeah, you just. Um, advertise. So advertise. So you've, a market, a department develops the product or service, another market advertises. Now, should it really be that way? The question that I'm trying to say is this. What if the people who developed the product or the service are not in tune with the market? They don't really know what do customers want need or desire, then they give you a computer. The computer could really work, and technically speaking, it could be superior. But when you try to sell it to the market, there is, there is an issue. You advertise, but people still don't buy. And, and these are, this is a real example when actually, uh, especially sometimes in huge companies, when there is a disconnection between the dif different, different uh, uh, departments of, of, of a given uh, institution. This can be even in, uh, in an educational institution set up. If, if we, for example, in, the, in an academic department, develop a product or a degree or, uh, or, or, or training that we think that the market needs, but maybe the market doesn't really need. And then the marketeers will have a very difficult time uh, selling it. Not to mention that the price could be wrong, the, uh, the value proposition could be off from what the uh, customers are looking for. So what I would like to do today is to define marketing in a slightly different way. And I am not going to talk about how much money you should spend on advertising or what are the channels of advertising and, and so on and so forth. I think these are things that we, we are um, maybe aware of, at, at least aware of its existence. And I would like you really to develop some understanding on the market in general, the market dynamic. Is there any framework for me to understand how things happen uh, in the market? So I, I would like us all to develop knowledge of the market, the customer requirements, the customer needs, and the customer's desires. Then we all think in the framework of conceiving, designing, implementing, and operating. So I would like to argue that marketing is conceiving for the market. Designing for the market. Implementing, which means manufacturing and, and, and building and whatever for the market. And eventually operating for the market. I'll talk more about this uh, maybe now. So for example, if I want to make this marker pen, 
So I've designed it, I've conceived it for the market. I know uh, what the users, who will be maybe lecturers, t uh, teachers, students would want. Then I designed it in an appealing way, the right weight and everything, so that it suits what the market is asking for. How can I implement this for the market? So now you have the blueprint, you can just send it to the, to the, uh, to the factory and they will make it. How can we implement, how can we, let's say, manufacture, let, 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 me, let me be specific, how can we manufacture for the market? How can the way you manufacture impact the marketability of your product? That's the question. Is the question clear? Tommy, is the question clear? Quite clear. So my question is this. Let's say I have designed this product. I've conceived it and I've designed it so now it is on paper. I have the engineering drawing for it. I could just send it to the factory and they will be able to make it for me. Okay, now by right I should have considered the needs, the requirements and the desires of the customer already. But here we are saying when you implement, when you bring this to life, when you manufacture it, you also have to manufacture it thinking of the market. So what does that mean? So that's my question. Would you like, is it clear now? Would you like to try to answer? Please? I cannot. You can't answer. Yeah. Okay. Samali, what do you think? So did you like mean when you're manufacturing the pen, you have to think of the markets also? Yes. D tell me a bit more. So like thinking what the customers would want and add it to the pen. When are you, when are you manufacturing it? Yeah, but you see what I have done by right during the conceiving and the designing, I've considered all the customers needs, requirements, and desires. So this it looks nice, feels nice, has the right weight, will be able to write for so long. So now I'm not really changing the design. The design is complete. I know it will look exactly like this. But let, 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 me, let me give you a, a hint. When you manufacture it, you could manufacture it in Germany, Costs you maybe that much. You could manufacture it in China. You could manufacture it here. You could. So how would this impact? How would the way you manufacture impact the marketability of this marker pen? Not knife wants to try. Okay. Um, when, when you manufacture it, uh, the process that you use, um, if the manufacturing process is expensive that means the overall price of the product is also uh, higher right that means uh, you must use the proper manufacturing method so that when the product is out in the market yes it's, it's affordable to the right uh, customers sure so so from 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 a, a, a cost point of view if you if you use innovative ways then uh, maybe you can sell it cheaper which is, which is quite a valid point. Now, can I use my manufacturing methods as a selling point? Uh, yes, yeah, let me give a, okay, yeah, let's take Chris first and then Marwan, yeah. Um, I really think it depends on the market, like we learned in the previous class where there's a niche market and then, you know, um, some people would want man it manufactured by a more reputable um, country per se, like say if, uh, I'm kind of like a higher-end user. Mm. I wouldn't want to use stuff that is made in China, for instance. So, so like the iPhone? I mean, yeah, but... <laughs> 
So it really depends on the market and um, what exactly they are looking for because right. even though the manufacturing cost might be expensive, but there are people who's willing to pay more for quality. Sure. Okay. My one want to say something? Yeah. Some some fountain paints. Can you some fountain paints? Yeah. It has a gold plated uh, uh, tip. Right. So it could be used as during the manufacturing. I coat it with a gold. Yes. And it could be used as uh, marketing. Uh, right. Uh, so so the marketing point. method could be used maybe to reduce the cost, or could be used to differentiate the product and raising the cost. Okay. Anyone else want to say something else? Okay. Uh, uh, Bring it closer. Mm. I think um, the way you manufacture a product yes. determines the end quality of the product. Right. And therefore, you should choose a manufacturing process that not only uh, determines the cost of the product, yes. but the quality of the product. That's a very important thing. Right. So if the quality is good, then right. you have your market. OK. So, so you want to say something else? Oh, OK. OK. Um, we all heard the case in which the people who are made, working for Apple in China were getting sick because of some of the chemicals used. Uh, you, as a user of the iPhone or the iPad, won't be exposed to it. But the people who are working may be exposed to it. Now, um, there, are, there are some markets that are very sensitive to where this thing was manufactured. Did you harm the environment while making it? Were there children, la children labor was uh, used during manufacturing it? The, 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 the quality is perfect. A and B and C are exactly the same product. For you as a, as a user, from a, a product point of view, there is no difference. But the way this was implemented, the way it was created and built and delivered, you know, could be something that is not in line with your values. Now, why I'm saying this? Because different markets behave differently. There are certain parts of the world where people actually don't really care about where this was, uh, um, you know, made, how was it made. They will, their, their uh, uh, main, uh, uh, Concern could be the quality, does it work, the price, and things like that. But if you are trying to sell the same thing in a different market, they will need to ask you this question. Uh, did you use uh, sustainable materials when you make it? This is a very important thing for that market. So often these things are not perceived as marketing uh, of, of marketing importance. But these decisions, what I'm trying to drive to you here is, you have to conceive for the market, you have to design for the market, you have to be sensitive so that when you implement, you implement for the market as well. So if you are manufacturing, you ask yourself, where is this thing gonna be sold? Okay, so this is gonna be sold, let's say, in Finland. And in Finland, if, for example, if I'm selling this, and a newspaper say I used child labor to make it, or I used uh, uh, human slavery to make it, I think I'm gone, right? No one will buy it. So, so these kind, of, this kind of things that you will need to, to, to be aware of while you are, you are marketing, uh, or developing the value in terms of marketing. So operating, how you deliver it, how you service it, again, same, same, con same concept. So, so if you are, for example, uh, having a taxi company, and you say, all my taxis are hybrid. In certain markets, people would prefer you to maybe another company that is not using hybrid, because there are certain people, their values, their set of values is to be, um, uh, what do you call that, to be uh, environmental friendly, aware of the grand challenges that we are facing. So this is, this is I, I thought this is a very important 
uh, introduction before we, we move on. So I, I'm, I'm going to really talk about marketing as an integrated framework so that you always think as an entrepreneur of the market and you conceive for the market, you design for the market, and you implement for the market. Any question? Okay, so let us move on if there's no question. So that's what we have just said. We say we see the IO for the market, and if you recall, we talked about when we evaluate ideas, we want the ideas to be viable, so they are economically viable, they make business sense, but they have to be also technologically feasible. The technology to make them is available, is attainable, it's not something that uh, out of this world or someone else is protecting it with a patent and I don't have access to it. It has to be desirable, it has to look nice, it has to feel nice, and it has to be sustainable. And as we said, depending on the project, this may not be given exactly the same, um, uh, the same weightage, but depending on your market and your product and service you are delivering, uh, these are the things that you will need to consider. So throughout your work, you conceive, design, implement, and operate. You are weighing the economical uh, factors against or together with the technological aspects as well as the desirability and the sustainability. If you keep on thinking of all of these and you adjust them based on your product or service as well as your um, uh, market, I think the likelihood of success is gonna be much higher. So let me talk about the life cycle of a product or a service. And, uh, and, and, and this is a, this is a typical life cycle. Maybe some of the product didn't really go through that or will not go through it. But majority of the products will, and services actually, will go somehow through that. Now, um, for those at the back, you know, this is, this is a, a mobile phone. So it's a new product when it came. And it, it was extremely expensive. And, um, and as every new product starts its journey with only a few people willing to try it, able to purchase it, so it's, um, it's a novelty. It's good to have, even if you buy it, not everyone has one so that you don't really can maybe call, uh, call, call many people, but it, it's a novelty. Then eventually, it, 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 it becomes slightly better, but it's still expensive, performance is not that great, coverage, let's say in the case of the phone, is not always available. But as time goes by, more customers start to use it, become a bit cheaper, uh, um, and um, the performance improves. And eventually, this is actually a pile of phones. Uh, it becomes a commodity. Everyone has it. The price is almost more or less the same, and it becomes a commodity. Now, when you hear the word commodity, what comes to your mind? Who can define commodity for us? When someone say this is a commodity, what does that mean? Give us an example of a commodity. Um, I guess commodity is something that becomes part and parcel of your daily life. Okay. Um, it's more of a necessity than something that you would want. Right. Um, okay. W wh what is the origin of the word commodity? It's something common. Give us an example of, oh, okay, when we say the prices of commodities, what do we actually are referring to? Yeah, anyone wants to try besides, uh, yeah, I said? Price of maybe common goods that are available to us. They Give us an example of a commodity. Oil maybe. Oil. Yeah. What else? Car. Car. Yeah. Okay. Or clothes maybe. Clothes maybe, yes, maybe. Okay. Who, who else wants to try? Commodity. When you, see, when you hear the word commodity and say the prices of commodities. Um, it's more like staple goods like rice, sugar. Gold. Gold. Oil. Yeah. Right. So these are the, th a commodity is... 
if you if you see if you have wheat or rice and let's say this was planted in that part of Thailand whether this wheat was planted by an engineer or a farmer it won't really affect that uh, the, the grain of rice you won't be able by analyzing it to tell who planted it so these are items like again like oil so when they say the prices of oil goes up all the oil will go up and some when the, they say the price of gold was going down all the gold will go down because it's the it's a material that has the same chemical composition how can i differentiate if it's pure gold whether i get it from australia malaysia or from uh, uh, South Africa, it will look the same. I could melt it and put it together. Likewise, tin, rubber, coffee, coffee beans, not the coffee from Starbucks, that's a different one. Yeah, I'm in a different case. So coffee beans, uh, uh, wheat, these are commodities. Now a product itself can become a commodity. So that's the example of the mobile phones when they um, the, 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 the value that they, could, they can give becomes so similar. You, every phone at that time can make call, receive call, send text message. Uh, it has a, a, a screen. It has a keypad. It's very difficult, actually, to make, make it different. So a product starts as a novelty. Very few people use it. Very expensive. Performance is not that great. Eventually, it becomes a commodity. The, uh, the, 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 the prices are similar, the performance are similar, and the competition is, is really high between, between the, um, the providers. So this is actually a picture for those. I don't know, you can, can you see what is this? I, I took this picture in the supermarket. This is where the salt are. So you have, so everything is, is sodium chloride, is, but it's, uh, they have so many products. Maybe we'll come back to this, uh, to this uh, part again. This is an example of a product that becomes a commodity. It, it's just sodium chloride, NaCl, table salt. So I will talk now about Novelty products and services, and I am basing this model on a book, on a book that's called Crossing the Chasm. It's written by Jeffrey Moore. So the model says when you have a new product, when, you, when there is a novel product in the market, and a, uh, it's, and a novel means something that is entirely new, for example, we didn't have phone, then we suddenly have phone. That's a novel product. Very few people have it. Uh, even if you, if you fix a phone line at home, not everyone has it. You don't really know how to use it. Uh, the, the bill I expect was rather expensive. Then it's, it's a novelty. Now, this model here indicates that the novelty products and services will always be picked and used by people who we call them innovators. They are ones who will try new things. Now this, all of us are innovators in one way or another. So there are some of us who will, if there is a new restaurant, they would like to try it. They are maybe innovators when it comes to food. There are some people amongst us, when there's a new technology, they want to purchase it very quickly. They want to try it. Even if no one has used it yet, they are not sure it's good. It's definitely not cheap yet, but they just want to, they just want to try it. So we call these people the innovators. Then these innovators, when they, they, know, they know people, so let's say it's, it's, a, it's a new camera or it's a new phone, when it's out, the innovators wants to have it. But these are very small um, uh, percentage of, of the market. 
then these people will talk to another group of people. We call them the early adopters. These, these guys, when they see the, uh, the ad, when the innovators start using the new phone or camera, then they will be also purchasing or utilizing or willing to accept or use. Now, once you reach this, which is around maybe, I don't know, 9 10% of the market, it seems there seems to be a chasm. You know what's a chasm? It's, it's a very deep valley. It's very difficult to cross. The product needs to cross. Only then it can get the early majority. So more and more people are now using it. Because more people are using it, it becomes a sort of a standard kind of thing. The price will go down and more people will be willing to use it eventually. So this is how, if you think, especially of technology, uh, technology products, but also almost everything else. You, you know, uh, uh, restaurants that serves in a different way. Um, a, a food that people haven't really um, uh, get accustomed for, and, 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 and things like that. So this is how the uh, market or uh, the, the cycle of growth of uh, a novel product takes place based on, on, this, on this model. So who do you think is among you, who do you think is uh, an innovator? It's, let's say in technology. You could just point to the person. So you, so you point to Mike, right? You point to Mike. I also point to Mike. Now, now just listen to this. How many of you, before buying a gadget, consulted Mike? So those who know him, I actually, before I purchase a camera, I call, even in the market, he, it, while I'm in the, in the shop. He very quickly does a comparison and almost everything I purchase actually was after he approved it. I'm serious. Now, this is, this is very important. This is very important. Now, I am also, maybe I am here. And actually, Marwan, often gets my opinion about things before he gets them. He's, he's, when it comes to technology, maybe he's here or maybe a bit, a bit down, down, the, down the, um, the curve. This is extremely important because if, if Mike say, don't buy, I actually won't buy. It, it's not about the advertisement. It's not about the how many megapixels. He tells me, no, this one is not stable yet. He just needs to say this. I say, okay, thanks. So what should I do? Oh, no, buy that one. So, so this, is, this is a real thing. So if the innovators use the product or the service and they are not happy about it, they are not talking about it, then most likely your product won't have enough penetration in the market. And when it does not ha have enough penetration, the product won't be able to, you know, become standard, uh, uh, reduce the prices, and so on. And then the rest of things won't, 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 won't happen. So these, this last part, the lagger, these people, you cannot change them. The only way you change them is the product, the old product they use is no longer in the market. So they have to use the, the, the new product. They have no choice. So this is actually, I found this a very interesting um, framework to understand if you are coming up with a novel product. Now, what I mean by novel product is, now we all know about the tablet and the iPad. That if you come up with something that's entirely different, revolutionizes the way that we are dealing with our mobile devices, that could be a novel, a novel product. And when you come up with a novel product, the question is to me as a customer is this, should I buy it? Uh, don't I have a device that's already working? 
uh, what value will it be adding, and, and things like that. So I would like to talk uh, now about the market evolution. So if you think of the y-axis being the performance over the price of whatever you are purchasing, and the x-axis, the horizontal axis, to be time. We expect that as time goes by, this curve is going up or down. Should be going up. So as time goes by, either the performance of a product or a service increases, or its price will, will come down. This is true for almost, um, or almost anything. Now, on this space, a new product, a novel product, it just, it just appears somewhere. We, we are not really sure uh, because it's the only one. So we don't know. This is a new phone, a mobile phone. It, it weighs uh, 10 kilograms, but it's still mobile. Uh, is this heavy? Is this light? We don't really know. It, it appears somewhere. Now, as time goes by, then people start to create other uh, devices, smaller devices, ch cheaper devices, and services. I'm, whatever I'm saying actually is applicable to both a product and a service. But sometimes, because a product is more concrete, it's easier for us to, to speak about. So as time goes by, uh, a range of a market develops. So you will have a high end of a market, still you know, giving you uh, continuously better performance to value as time goes by. And there is a lower end of the market. Again, this is, this is a typical uh, ki typical kind of uh, market evolution. So this is a new novel product. So let's say that's the uh, portable phone. And then as time goes by, you will have a uh, high end of the market, which is maybe, I don't know, in the beginning you reach a stage where Nokia was maybe the top end of the market. There are some other uh, phones that are maybe not branded, they are here. But as you move on, the value that you could deliver to the customer is very similar, and, um, and, and, and these two curves come closer to each other, and that's the time when a product becomes a commodity. So it's, it's more or less the same. Um, the difference between high end and, and low end is, uh, is, is very difficult to, to differentiate. So this is how, I, as I told you, the, uh, normally the market uh, evolves. Now, I don't know if you know, when you talk about cars, is this the same trend? I think the cars are yet, you still the high end of market, they keep because of brand and status, but the, the lower end of market is actually picking up, the quality is improving, they are uh, you know, able to put the safety features in and, 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 and while maintaining the price. So that's, that's in a way is, is a good thing. So this lower end of the market, what does, it, what does it indicate? And what does the high end of the market indicate? Here means, you know, if you give me more performance, maybe I, don't really need it, you know. Like you give me a car that uh, that can uh, can drive at 1,000 kilometer an hour. So this is a very high performance, and that will require I don't know much higher price. So performance to price is still okay, but you are asking me now to pay 10 times the price, even at the high end. Maybe I'm not not really interested in that because where will I drive it? So this sets sort of the upper upper limit. Now, in the, in the lower you know, end of the car, if you really think of a, the most basic cars, I think it would be a car that needs to take you from point A to point B. Maybe there's no air conditioning, there's no um, um, uh, 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 audio system or whatever. That's, that's still maybe acceptable, but uh, you won't accept a car that 
breaks down every day or you know so this is really like the lowest expectation of of the market so this is how the market evolves uh, there's a book by um, Clayton we, I'll, I'll get the I'll the name of the author is actually written on the slide, so I'll remember it later. It's called The Innovator's Dilemma. And it talks about, a t uh, uh, it talks about a type of innovation that he calls disruptive innovation. And the disruptive innovation is something that, by Clayton Christensen, it comes from here. So suddenly, someone comes up with a product that is below the lower end of the market. So it's, it's, it's here. And in, in terms of performance, the performance is not really that, that great. But maybe because it's so cheap, few people start to use it. So, so let's say if we are talking about making phone calls, um, Overseas, you have maybe service A, service B. Uh, this high end of the market would give you a secure line. You could do your you know, business transactions across it or things like that. This would be maybe the normal, the normal kind of line. And suddenly, a company comes and gives you uh, internet telephony for free. Now, this internet telephony is going to be free or very cheap, but the performance is not that good. So these people who are providing for this market, they, th they feel like, oh, my customer will never want to use this service. This service is you know, not really up to the standard. So they will, never, they will never use that service. Then, but as more people accept this service, suddenly this line intersects with this. And it becomes like maybe even the lower end of market, they can actually start using the service. And if the trend continues, these people could actually give a better performance to price, a better value, even before the, the uh, high end of market appears. And then those players in this region will start to lose market share. Very interesting book, The Innovator's uh, Dilemma, because it says you, why big companies fail when small company comes in and then you know, forces them to change things or even disappear entirely from, from the existence. So can you think of an example of a disruptive innovation? Something that didn't come really from here, it came from here. So the service is not new, but it came from, from, from there. Yes, uh, 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 Dominique here? Yeah. The, the, Asia. Air Asia, or in general, the, uh, the budget airline. Yes. So budget airline, you have, you have these uh, normal uh, airlines, and then suddenly Rainair and Virgin and so on. This is where it really started, and Southwest in the United States. They came up with very cheap alternative. Maybe in the beginning, not many people used it. The, the bigger airlines, they thought, oh, this will, no one will ever use that service. But as we go on, literally in Europe, the bigger companies had to either change their business model, some of them even went out of business. So that's a disruptive innovation. The budget airline did not create the airplane. They did not create the air travel. These are things that we already know. They just looked at the market, identified the high end of it, the low end of it, and actually poached it from underneath. Very good example. So, so this is the model that I would like you to keep in your mind. Here you have a novel product 
and then slowly the, the value of proposition becomes very similar, eventually it becomes a commodity. People don't really compete on the product or the service itself, they compete on other things which we will be talking about. And, and, and at any time, someone could come, depending on the market, could come from this end and change the world, create a new reality. So I would like to talk about entry to market. How do you go, or what are the pathways for you to go to market? So you can either come up with a novel product, something that no one else has used before or tried before, so it's a new value proposition. Or you could start with disruptive innovation. So you, again, look at your market, see how, you, how can you disrupt it. Or you could look at a commoditized product, your salt, water, gold, anything, and start trading in that. That's also a possibility. Or you look at a product that is in the mature market. So it has high end, low end, you know who the high end players are, you know who the low end players are, and who are in between, what is the market share, everything you know, and then you go and try to compete in that market. So that's also a possibility. These are normally the entry to market, the points of entry to market that an entrepreneur have. Now you could always ignore this and you say, oh, my idea is different. But if you have a framework that will help you, even if you don't really have an idea, to see how you can get into, into the market. So we, we talk about marketing novel products and services. So how, I'm bringing the curve again. So there's a, this chasm that we need to cross. So if you decide to come up with um, a new way to, tra to, to travel, a new, uh, a new way to communicate, a new way to eat, things that requires people to change their habits, change the way they do things, then how to do it? So it's, it's novel, it's new, it's revolutionary. It's, you need to have a vision. What kind of world do you want to see so that your product and service, when it's accepted, the world will become a different place? And the risk is high. We know only of the products that cross the chasm. There are other products, other services that start and die. There are restaurants that open and close. There are products that, you know, doesn't necessarily make it, you know, across even after, the, after companies uh, have uh, spent so much money on, on them. Can you give me an example of a product that did not cross the chasm? Revolutionary product, great product, cool, we still in existence, but didn't really become the, what it was destined to be. Beaches. What's that? Pagers, is pagers, I mean, pagers used to be, so pagers didn't make it across, right? Are you saying that very few people use pagers and they di died? Yes, so, so, so few people tried it, then they felt, then something happened and it didn't cross. So now not everyone is using it. Can you think of a product, a service, a product? Yes, uh, can you send the mic there, please? Okay, he's, he's good, yeah. It's not a product per se, but like uh, Google Plus, uh, before it came out, the fuss was very much, it's going to, you no, know, it's going to replace Facebook, it's going to be bigger, but it's not that big right now, so. Right. right. Uh, this could be true because they keep on like bugging me. These people joining Google Plus do it, and I just, for whatever reason, I just don't want to go there. Yeah, I just like delete, I keep on deleting it. Very good point, very good point. Yes, any other product or service, please? Yeah, one, uh, uh, can we have the mic, please? Can we say, uh, can we say video, uh, video call? Video call. 
So vi video call is, uh, I think, yeah, maybe you have, you have a point. I don't know whether the video call didn't make it across because of it's here or because the technology is not yet there. But yes, so the video call was also uh, telling us that we will change the way we do business. Maybe uh, you can just press a button and you have your virtual meeting. But it's not really that easy. You know, every time you want to do it, it's complicated, it's difficult. And those people, actually thinking about it, this is a very good example. Because those people who were willing to use it are really the innovators. They are the, let me try to do it. Let me show you how does it work. But when it keeps on failing the innovator, the innovator is very difficult for him or her to recommend it to the early majority, uh, so early adopters and early majority. So it, 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 it is unable to, to cross the chasm. Yes, very good examples. More? Have you heard of the Segway scooter? This was supposed to change the way we, we go about going around. You know, you know this, this Segway scooter? And, and for whatever reason, it, it couldn't, it couldn't cr cross the chasm. Because you see, if we could have built a bigger number of users, I believe the prices would have gone down and, and uh, maybe we wouldn't have traffic jam, leaving the university, but for whatever reason, it actually did not cross the chasm. So how can we market an, a novel product if we are really having a novel product? The key thing is you really need to focus on the innovators. So when you have video call, video call or video conferencing and you have a, a bit of money for advertisement, don't spend it on like trying to sell it to everyone. My customer is everyone. Focus on those who will have, who will be most likely to use it. Try to get these people involved. And then empower the innovators to influence the early adopters. How to empower the innovators? Give them the product for free. Teach them how to do it. Uh, invite them to your uh, shows. Make sure that these people are impressed and happy with your product and or service. So this is how you could, because these guys and these people, the moment you cross the chasm, the moment you have around 20% of the people using your product or service, you are going to grow provided that you continue watching the market, providing the, the value proposition and watching competition. But before this, it's not necessarily if the innovators purchased your scooter or if 4%, 3% get registered for Google Plus, it's not necessarily it's going to replace Facebook. Okay? So this is how the, the, the strategies that uh, we are proposing if you are having a novel product. Now, I would like you to please keep in mind that we are doing this in the, also in the, in the uh, spirit of writing our business plan. So as you speak, as we speak, I want you to think of your project and if you have any question you, you, you ask me, I'll try to answer, but I think the wisdom within the room is, 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 is big, and we can all try to answer and address any question that you have. So novel product examples, I think, if you think of the, I've, I've picked something related to, to, the, um, um, to telecommunication. So telegraph used to be really novel. The fact that you could send a short message very quickly, that was something that changed the world, literally. Then. Telephones. I don't know anyone sends telegraphs now? Now, when was the last time you sent a telegraph, Tommy? Never. Never, okay. So, so telegraph, then you have the telephones. So suddenly, it's not only you could send a text with Morse code and then someone has to decipher it for you. You can listen to someone's voice. You, you need 
some cabling, and, but you still can do it. Then mobile phones came, and then mobile phones also became somehow commoditized. Then you have the iPhone. You know, I didn't say the smartphone because I think the iPhone really started uh, uh, some sort of revo a revolution. Now, uh, how much is iPhone 5? 1,000? 2,000. Okay, let's say 2,000. How much, how much is an equivalent Samsung? It's actually the same price. It's very interesting that the price is, is almost the same. Now, I find it very difficult to tell which one is better. I mean, in terms of services, they are, they are similar. So sometimes it tells you that I'm, I'm, I don't want to be uh, caught saying this uh, on, 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 on camera, but this is, a, in a way, is commoditization, isn't it? So it's, in a way, a co serve, the, the value proposition is similar, the price is similar, and the customer is very difficult for you to tell which one is better. While if you, if you go to a different market, you would know that, let's say, car A is high-end. Car you know, car B maybe not, and then it depends on your budget, on your, your needs, and, 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 and things like that. So this, these are examples of novel products that keep on replacing maybe an existing uh, product that is all in the same family, which is in communication. Uh, disruptive innovation. So this is what, how we said disruptive innovation would come. Normally it would come from below. In the beginning, people say, ah, this will never pick up. Uh, my customers will never want to use this service until if you are a provider of a service, you are surprised that people are not, not buying your product or they are not using your email service or they are not coming to your university because something is happening. And maybe it's something that you saw and you discounted, you opted to ignore. So if you want to disrupt a market, you need first to identify the market that you are going to, to, to disrupt. Is it the education market? Is it the bottled water market? Is it the, uh, uh, the, the uh, salt market? I don't know. You have to identify the market. Then you identify, uh, try to address the needs of customers that are not addressed. So maybe these are the customers who even the lower market is still expensive for them. So these people, even the lower end, they still cannot maybe afford it. And that's, that's the beauty of it is really, I mean, your, Dominic, your example is beautiful. Because even the lower market for air travel, there are people who are unable to, to pay for that. So for them, they are like the, the, uh, the providers of air travel, the, conventional airlines at that time. They never thought of people here to be in their market because they say my ticket even, let's say, between two cities will be 500 US dollar. This guy will never be able to have that much of money to spare on an air ticket. So they are out. And someone came and, and changed, changed uh, the world by addressing the, the need or a customer segment that is um, uh, not really being addressed. You also could address the needs and desires of existing customers maybe that are currently not addressed. So this is how you, you come up with a disruptive kind of uh, innovation. So examples, budget airlines, as you said, is an example. Skype is an example. Now it's getting more and more um, uh, stable. I think the internet, as it goes, you know, better. They are creating um, their hotspots. Even when you travel overseas in certain countries, you can still, even without Wi-Fi connection, they will charge you to your account. So very, very interesting kind of service. You, you, when you travel, you don't have to change your uh, uh, phone number. You can still use Skype to call home, and uh, maybe the MOOC. Who knows, right? I mean, who knows, People, the universities now say, ah, this MOOC will never pick up because those guys online are not getting any credit from it. Uh, they cannot graduate based on that. But who knows, as time goes by, maybe the employers start to say, oh, this MOOC is actually very good. 
uh, or if they say, uh, for you to join this job, you need to attend MOOC 1, MOOC 2, MOOC 3, MOOC 4. So if you, after you finish your high school, you know, if you attend these few MOOCs, you can get the job you want, maybe you decide not to go to the university. This is a bit far-fetched, but th these are scenarios that could happen. And as, as we speak, the people in the, at the universities are saying that, oh, this MOOC is a fad, it will, it will never pick up, because it costs the university money, the university doesn't make anything out of it, the people who are online, maybe they're not necessarily um, uh, uh, that motivated to continue because they don't get the credit, they won't get a degree, but you will never know. You will never know. So how to market a commoditized product? You know, I uh, actually bought some examples with me here of products that This is my favorite. So this is salt. I bought it all from the same place. Okay. So I'm not promoting the brands. And this one because it's imported. It's more than 15 times the price of this. So this is literally, is, it is the same commodity. So how do you, if you want to go into the salt business, how, what to do? How, how to go there and still make money? Now, these are some of the brands. And this is, again, I think double, at least double the price of this. Tesco is a gen generic brand of the supermarket that you, you buy from. Now, water, bottled water, the, the difference could literally be five, six, sometimes I've seen up to 12 times between product A and product B. So when you are working with a commoditized kind of product, what, what should you do? I think the key thing is to try to differentiate the product. The product has to be different. So how do you differentiate this compared to this? So they say this is iodized. This is not. But, but does it really, uh, maybe the chemical engineers here, is iodine that expensive to actually warrant that it's like more than 10 times the price? I don't think so. It's not. It's not. But it makes it different. Now, once you say this is iodized, this is not then you, even your marketing message would be very, very different. You are not selling salt anymore. You are selling health. And, and maybe you can convince people to purchase something at such a high price. Now, this guy actually says iodized salt, and it's still very cheap. So he, he opted to go maybe to the, to the ma mass kind of market. This is my favorite. This is not salt. This is mountain salt. So what does mountain salt mean? Is it better than the sea salt? I, I'm also not, not very sure. Um, this, is, uh, this is sea salt grinder. So this is not only um, uh, salt, but you have a grinder with it. So, so this is another way to differentiate. So to me, this is different, not because the product is different, but because this, I could maybe use it right away compared to the other one that is 
uh, I have to pour it into something, you know, a, a container at home and, 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 and things like that. So these are examples of how you could differentiate your product because without differentiation, your margin is gonna be extremely, extremely small. Now, as we say, you can fortify it with iodine. What you could do also to again make the product different, you bundle it with something else. So sometimes they, you buy this, they give you something free. Maybe you don't want this, you want the free. So, so that also, in a way, makes product A different from product B. This is normally happens in, you know, if you look at the cereals, the cereals are more or less the same. But when you advertise this kind of cereals, they never advertise the cereal per se. There's a little bit about nutrition that is targeted at maybe the parents. But most of it will show you this Toy Story uh, characters eating the cereal, playing with the cereal, and that actually creates a differentiation because cereal A has a Toy Story picture and it has a Toy Story character inside and cereal B doesn't have that. So it's a commodity, you have to differentiate it. If you don't differentiate it, you are only competing on the price. And when you are competing on the price, it's extremely difficult for you to, uh, uh, to, to achieve a, a good profit margin. So <clears throat> the last part is when, how to market in a mature market. I'm not necessarily the expert in this, but I, I think we need to decide which end of the market you wanna ser service. So if you recall when we in, in our previous classes, we talked about segmenting the market, uh, how you address the market. So are you planning to uh, service the high end, the lower end, the middle end, or are you uh, uh, servicing only a certain segment of the market? And again, there you will need to differentiate. So the key thing is when you have a different, when you have a different product, it's easier to sell it. It's easier to create awareness for it. It's easier to communicate. It's easier to eventually render a profit if the profit is your, uh, your, uh, your, your, your target. So, so for example, there's an existing market. How do I differentiate it based on the customer needs, the customer desires? Bread, that's organic bread. The other one is not organic. Um, you can, if, if the product that you have is environmentally friendly or if it is um, um, made in an environmental friendly way, these are the things that you need to really focus on if the market is sensitive to them so that you differentiate your product. And you have to focus on customer service. So I'm... Uh, actually done now, and if you have any question, I'll be more than happy to attempt to answer. Otherwise, uh, we, can, we can stop here. But before we go, so any questions now? Any comment, any reflection? Yes, there's a question here, yes please? No, no questions, actually I, I, I think uh, it's a good idea about how to uh, market a normal product. But I think this can implement to the, those products who are already at the stage that that going to close down and etc. Which one? I, for instance, the mattress. The mattress. The mattress. The match. Last the time, match stick. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh -huh. match stick. So I think this is one of the business maybe you can apply. Right. So this, you, yeah. you mean for the commoditized product mm, or yes, the, yes. even product? The, the commoditized product. Right. Yeah. Yes. Because some products is going to phase out even right yeah. right okay. so how to keep a product so if you have the matches if people don't really use them so how do you sell them maybe you sell them as a lifestyle rather than something to uh, to start a fire or to lit a cigarette yeah thank you very much any other question or comment if not then I would like to thank you very much for uh, being here 
and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thanks.